Hi, and welcome to Cannabis Helps Dementia. I'm Chella. I'm Dave. And right up front, we'd like to say we're not doctors or medical professionals, and nothing you hear in this podcast should be considered medical advice. Right. So, in 2010, after my mom was diagnosed with mixed dementias, vascular and Alzheimer's disease, we dove into family caregiving and became fierce advocates for people living with dementia. We're kind of experts now. We're not. But throughout this podcast series, you'll hear from doctors, nurses, researchers, administrators, other caregivers, and people living with dementia about how cannabis helps. Like it did for our family. That's right. And in this premiere episode, we have our first real expert, world-renowned authority on the medical use of cannabis, Dr. Ethan Russo, will tell us about the research on how cannabis helps dementia. But first, we'd like to share some of our story, how cannabis helped Chella's mom after she was diagnosed with the most common forms of the disease. Yeah, we noticed she was forgetting stuff, but nothing too weird. Repeating stories. She wasn't taking her medications properly. Wait till you get old, she'd say. And she hadn't been cooking much. I've cooked for people all my life. I'm done. She was getting lost driving. But that wasn't so unusual. She always had a bad sense of direction. She paid her bills multiple times in the same month and became seriously overdrawn. All right, that's what alerted us that something was wrong. Mom fell a few times, but she really hated going to doctors. The last one was spectacular enough to scare her into a visit to the emergency room. Yeah, at the hospital, the doctor said flatly, Miss Seagram, you have dementia. In another room, the social worker told us, You know she can't live alone, right? And just like that, our whole world turned upside down. Dementia is still a great mystery to science. Well, they know little more today than they did over 100 years ago when Dr. Alzheimer named the most common type. That's probably why it's the most feared diagnosis. Dementia affects more women than men and more people of color than whites. Maybe that's the reason research has been historically underfunded. There are more than 16 million unpaid family and friend caregivers for the nearly 6 million Americans currently living with dementia. And there are an estimated 47 million people worldwide in the same boat. The cost of dementia care in the U.S. is now around $277 billion annually, and that is expected to grow to a trillion by 2050. When I'm 80, a trillion dollars a year. It's really cynical, but if for no other reason, the cost of care is going to consume our economy unless something changes. We clearly need a new approach. Today in the U.S., one in three seniors dies with dementia. There are over 100 types. Mm. And in California, the most diverse and populous state, Alzheimer's is the leading cause of death among women. Dementia has no effective treatment. We, we don't know the cause, and there is no end in sight. Okay, but we digress. Back to our story. Right. Cut to interior world-famous Formosa Cafe night. A couple of film workers sit in a red vinyl booth. They're surrounded by an audience of vintage autographed headshots. Brando, Bogart, Marilyn, Elvis, all looking on as they toss back martinis crying in their mac and cheese about how their fun-loving, carefree lifestyle has suddenly been destroyed. She has f***ing Alzheimer's disease? We were clueless, self-centered, and lacked practical skills. Though I've done props on medical shows, as you know, we're not medical professionals, so we started to get educated. I read 15-plus books on Alzheimer's and related dementias, did loads of research, went to support groups, and every doctor visit with my research in hand and questions galore. We were still clueless. We found out that even the most experienced geriatrician, neurologist, or researcher is almost as clueless about the disease as the doctor I might play on TV. They know little more than Dr. Alzheimer did in 1906. The leading Alzheimer's organizations have all but given up on a cure and are now focused on prevention and promoting brain health as the solution to this devastating disease. Which is great for those who don't have dementia yet, but we desperately need effective treatments for people suffering today. I mean, I get it, but it's hard to avoid a disease, the cause of which we don't fully understand, and the research on prevention points to a massive overhaul of our diet and lifestyle. There's no quick fix. Obviously, the medical community is stymied by dementia. No effective treatment in over a century, no known cause, and no cure on the horizon. Yeah, you keep saying that. Let's get back to our story. Right. Cut to montage. We cared for mom at home the first four years. Initially, it was complete triage, constantly reacting to the major changes for all of us. Including having to live with my narcissist mother who had been intent on breaking us up since before our first date. 
Yeah, well, when we began this journey in 2010, we only knew Alzheimer's was a terrible disease that was bad news for your memory. Look, any form of dementia is no joke for all concerned. The irony is that the only way to get through it is to laugh and find the positive aspects. After all, your dreams have been crushed. But that took us some time to figure out. Little did we know, the answer was in our stash box all along. When my mom was diagnosed with dementia, the docs were very much against her using cannabis at all. She can't have marijuana. It's bad for her memory. Her neurologist held us hostage for a drug that's supposed to slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease and said she couldn't have it if she used marijuana. So we kept cannabis away from her for most of the first year. We didn't know the drug interactions. We didn't know anything. At the time. It was hard to tell the difference between side effects of the new prescription medication mom was on and the symptoms of Alzheimer's progression. You may have picked up. My mom had been rather demanding even before she got sick. They prescribed a benzodiazepine for her relentless anxiety and agitation, which worked great the first day. But she had an adverse reaction the day after when she totally freaked out and called me terrible names, accusing me of trying to kill her. They prescribed a powerful antipsychotic for the severe aggression. They called it dementia-related psychosis. There's a notice on the bottle that has a black box around it that reads... Warning, increased mortality in elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. Elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis treated with antipsychotic drugs are at an increased risk of death. Not approved for the treatment of patients with dementia-related psychosis. But Medicare paid for it. She was much nicer on the antipsychotic medication for a few days, but then back to the name-calling freakouts. They prescribed a different antipsychotic with the same warning to replace the first one. They prescribed an antidepressant. Because she was terribly depressed that she was losing her mind, her freedom, herself. They prescribed an anticonvulsant, a powerful seizure medication that has a similar black box warning. To relieve mom's restlessness and the cyclical constant questions. She never stopped asking the same questions over and over, and she developed a tremor, side effect of the anticonvulsant medication. They prescribed another antidepressant, off-label, to help mom's insomnia. And of course, they prescribed the common drugs that are supposed to slow down the disease process. All these medications have serious side effect warnings that include kidney and liver damage, organ failure, stroke, and sudden death. Which wouldn't be so bad if they actually helped at all. On the prescription meds taken as prescribed and on their lowest doses, mom fell frequently. Some of the less severe side effects of these drugs included nervousness, restlessness, and inability to sit still, which is particularly troublesome when there's also weakness, loss of balance, and dizziness. She experienced all those side effects, and worse, the meds didn't do anything for the symptoms we were trying to treat. Mom's falls forced me to take time off work, which is when we began to wise up. She had refused to get out of bed for three weeks. Somehow, she had remembered she had fallen several times and was terrified to fall again. Her new doctor was calling it failure to thrive. We thought for sure this was it. I was in her room, the TV on, researching side effects, drug-drug interactions, and smoking a joint. Mom turns to me and says, I want some of that. I call her new doctor, and she says, Look, she won't get out of bed. Give her anything she wants. So we shared a joint. Before we finish, Mom says, let's go to the living room and watch TV. This began the discovery. At first, we learned the U.S. Department of Health has held a patent on cannabinoids since 1998 as... Neuroprotectants, for example, in limiting neurological damage following ischemic insults, such as stroke and trauma, or in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. That's patent 6630507B1. And that led us to discovering the mountain of evidence that actually cannabis helps dementia. A simple PubMed search reveals study after study after study that cannabis eases the terrible symptoms of dementia better than anything else available on the market. A documentary called The Scientist shows that every nursing home in Israel uses cannabis medicine for their elderly. Mainstream media sources show that there are facilities in Northern California and New York State that are currently using full-spectrum cannabis oil for people living with dementia. 33 state departments of health list Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative diseases on their qualifying conditions for medical cannabis. How is it that two film workers turned family caregivers can uncover this life-changing information, but doctors seem willfully ignorant? Whatever happened to first do no harm? We stopped going to the doctors who had advised so strongly against cannabis and prescribed all the ineffective, off-label, black-box drugs. They were obviously not aware of the science of the last 20 years, nor did they seem interested. This was tricky because we didn't have many assets to speak of, and Mom was on Medicare and Medicaid. But her new, fresh-out-of-medical-school vegan doctor was really open-minded. 
I guess she believed in the power of plants because she certainly didn't learn about cannabis in medical school. Mom had greater focus and interaction when she was medicated with cannabis. She laughed, smiled, and communicated with us. It was like she dropped into her body and was able to connect better. Cannabis helped Mom have a carefree attitude about losing her mind. You need that. But cannabis is expensive. Medicare doesn't pay for it, and it's not covered by any insurance. As the disease progressed and our resources were drained, we had to move Mom into a facility. Despite our absurd preference to keep her at home with us. The nursing home said they would throw us out if we used cannabis, a Schedule One drug. The first nursing home mom was in actually did throw her out. After drug testing her for marijuana and telling me to knock it off or they would ask us to leave. They kicked mom out after she drew the foul when another woman pushed her from behind as they were walking to an activity. Mom spun around and slapped her in the face in retaliation. My mom was a leader of the girls gang growing up in Brooklyn. The facility wasn't medicating her agitation and aggression appropriately. Or at all. And wouldn't allow us to medicate her either. So what did they expect? We were forced to move mom into another facility where she lived for five years. The last two, confined to a bed, crumpled and contracted, betrayed by her broken brain. She was trapped in her body at the mercy of an understaffed and profit-driven Medicaid nursing home. After mom became nonverbal in the facility, she was even more easily ignored, force-fed, and left wet for hours. Until I was off work and I could get there to fix it. Every day, for years. It was a nightmare that only her transition could alleviate. After a nine-year-long journey through dementia, my mom passed on February 1st, 2019, and is now free at last. By the end, it was painfully obvious that her brain had been destroyed by Alzheimer's disease. Always my greatest teacher, my mom was once a brilliant and stunning beauty. A glamour girl of 60s Hollywood, a commercial realtor, an acting teacher who inspired talent manager who worked her ass off for her clients until she lost her mind. Cannabis medicine helped ease my mom's symptoms from the moment we started using it until her last breath, but only when she had access to it. In January 2019, the World Health Organization called for cannabis to be rescheduled internationally and admitted it was erroneously put on the Controlled Substances Act Schedule One of Drugs in 1971. That they'd been wrong for decades? Cannabis has been proven to help all the difficult symptoms of dementia, and it's a plant that grows all around the world, even in one's own backyard. Modern medicine is failing millions of people living with dementia, their families, and loved ones. We don't have to be restricted by draconian ideas on plant medicine any longer. However, because cannabis remains on the Controlled Substances Act, doctors lack education and are afraid of losing their licensing. And researchers have a very hard time funding studies and getting the plant material from the one and only government-approved grower in Mississippi at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Public pressure can change this. The suffering of millions of people living with dementia could be alleviated today with cannabis therapeutics. If government studies under prohibition taught us anything, it's that this plant has a mild side effect profile, has never killed anyone, and it contains patented antioxidants and neuroprotectants. With no end in sight for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, we must expand where we search for solutions to one of the scariest threats to human health and our national and global economy. Perhaps the reason there's no effective treatment for dementia nor its terrible symptoms is because of the Schedule One of drugs. Maybe at least part of the answer to complex brain issues is in plant medicine. Maybe all plants should be allowed to be studied before the cost of care eclipses the GDP. We must be bold. Like Dr. Ethan Russo, who we first met at a big medical cannabis conference where he was presenting findings on how cannabis helps balance the gut microbiome. Dr. Russo is a board-certified neurologist, psychopharmacology researcher, and former senior medical advisor to GW Pharmaceuticals, the maker of Epidiolex, the FDA-approved epilepsy medicine made from cannabidiol, or CBD. He was director of research and development for the International Cannabis and Cannabinoids Institute. We had a chance to sit down with Dr. Russo briefly at a conference shortly after his article, Cannabis Therapeutics and the Future of Neurology, was published in Frontiers in Integrative Neuroscience. Here's Dr. Russo chatting with us about how cannabis helps dementia. We're here with uh, Dr. Ethan Russo, neurological researcher, scientist, and um, all over badass in the field of neuroscience and cannabis. The problem right now is um, there have been individual studies of various cannabinoids, specifically THC and cannabidiol in relation to mechanisms 
uh, pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. There really haven't been any large clinical studies, however, and that's what we really need now. There have been a few studies specifically of synthetic THC as Marinol, specifically to look at agitation and sleep in Alzheimer's with positive results. But as most people know, THC alone is a very poorly tolerated drug, whereas cannabis that contains other components, particularly cannabidiol and a good terpenoid content, is going to be much better tolerated and potentially really contribute much more usefully um, to the benefits of cannabis in this patient group. Specifically, one of the things that I'd like to be able to, to demonstrate is that the terpenoid called pinene uh, has an effect actually to boost short-term memory. Drugs like pinene which are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, boost the amount of acetylcholine in the brain. That's the memory molecule. And so this, in conjunction with the other benefits of, of THC and other cannabis components, really presents a sort of multifocal approach to treating Alzheimer's. Uh, on the one hand, treating symptoms, but also uh, we have good lab evidence that THC and CBD can interfere with the buildup of abnormal proteins in the brain. That's one of the hallmarks of the disorder. Right. It, it's my thinking that more studies need to be done for the uh, treatment of the disease. But right now, there are 33 states where people living in those states could go to a dispensary and get something for their symptoms. Right. Well, this is a good demonstration that this is a bottom-up movement. What I mean by that is that, uh, unfortunately, physicians have been slow to get on board with cannabis, and the real movement is by patients and their families demonstrating to their doctors that, hey, if you see a, a benefit here, as compared to last month when she wasn't on this, it's because of cannabis, because we're not doing anything differently except for that. Um, so it's going to be a slow evolution. With that, we need progress uh, with the laws as well uh, so that we can do the studies properly and that this is more generally available. What do you think about hemp uh, in the um, farm bill passing? Do you think that's going to help well, move us? Uh, it may, but um, in this instance, we need some THC in the materials. That's what really treats the agitation and helps with sleep. It is a combination of THC, CBD, and other components that presents the best promise for really making a meaningful difference in treating Alzheimer's disease clinically. Wow. Let me just repeat that. It is the combination of THC, CBD, and other components that presents the best promise for really making a meaningful difference in treating Alzheimer's disease clinically. Emphasis added. <laughs> Dr. Russo is a member of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians and served as study physician to GW Pharmaceuticals' three phase three clinical trials of Sativex. Sativex is a one-to-one -one CBD to THC oral mucosal spray that delivers 10 milligrams of medicine per dose. And it's legal by prescription in more than 30 countries, but not the U.S. Sativex is being used in an exciting clinical trial for Alzheimer's at King's College London this year. We can't thank Dr. Russo enough for all his research and perseverance. For real, seriously. That review article that first introduced us to his work was mind-blowing because it cited all the studies that show how cannabis helps Alzheimer's disease as well as many other difficult neurological conditions. At the end of the Alzheimer's section, he breaks down which cannabis compounds address which symptoms. I was really impressed that he was so generous with his knowledge in the article and then in person. I wish we had known about Dr. Russo and his work when my mom was first diagnosed. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to connecting with him again. Thanks for joining us for our premiere episode of Cannabis Helps Dementia. 
be sure to download and like us on iTunes. And please share this series with anyone you know in relationship with dementia. You can download and listen to episode two with world-renowned dementia expert Tipa Snow and three with Dr. Jeffrey Hergenrather right now. Tipa Snow is an occupational therapist with 40 years of clinical practice. She founded a revolutionary approach to support and engage people experiencing changes in brain function and their care partners. I've taken a few of Tipa's trainings, and they helped me connect with my mom when I thought it was no longer possible. It really was life-changing stuff. Tipa shares her experience on how cannabis medicine helps people living with dementia. Episode 3 is with Dr. Jeffrey Hergenrather. We met Dr. Hergenrather at the same conference where we first met Dr. Russo. We bonded over a terrible panel on cannabis and Alzheimer's. Dr. Hergenrather has used plant medicine throughout his career and works with assisted living facilities in Northern California who are using full spectrum cannabis oil for people living with dementia. Great information from a clinician practicing this medicine for a long time. In 1999, Dr. Hergenrather also co-founded with Dr. Todd McCurria the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. So go download episodes two and three of Cannabis Helps Dementia on iTunes and be sure to like and share. Do you want to tell your story of how cannabis helps dementia? Drop us a note or connect with us on the socials. Check out the Society of Cannabis Clinicians website and find real medical professionals familiar with cannabis medicine in your area. Because you remember, we're not doctors, just family caregivers turned advocates. And don't forget, download, like, and share what you learn. Cannabis Helps Dementia. Mm-hmm.